lecture number 11, Threefold Love, and I'm in the basement of my home here in Colorado, and I hope you are um, having a good time. This is the toward the end of September 2022, and we will begin this lecture at this time. Great to be here with you again. It's a blessing for me personally to be a blessing to you, trying to teach you something about God's Word that will change your life for God's glory. I've been given a gift to teach and to preach, and we all need to learn more, so that is the purpose of these lectures. I also continue to be a student of God's Word myself. This is a lifetime commitment to gain everything I can on this side of paradise. I would hope that you become a lifelong learner of the things of God. The Bible calls us disciples. In Matthew 28 19, it says of us to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Biblical, disciple, biblical disciples were followers of the rabbi Jesus. They continue their tradition by listening to the Spirit teach us truth. Jesus directly taught his disciples truth. Now the Holy Spirit guides us directly as we read and study the Bible. Staying within a biblical understanding leads us to truth. Jesus directly taught his disciples truth. Now the Holy Spirit guides us directly as we read and study the Bible. Staying within a biblical understanding leads us to truth. The reason I say within the biblical understanding, in quotes, is that humanly we can't know all that there is to know about the writer's intent or the exact nature of the situation the writer is addressing. We have to stay solid on what we do know, but also a little flexible on what we may not know. The Holy Spirit guides us to help us with the truth and helps us with love. Truth is found because Jesus is the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the absolute unchanging knowledge of God. Let me zoom this in a little better so I can Read this a little bit easier. <laughs> information does change. Information will end. In fact, knowledge will end. That's an interesting perspective about the future, is how do we have no more information, no more knowledge? And I think it's because <laughs> we will totally only have wisdom in the future. So 1 Corinthians 13, 8 tells us that love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. In other words, knowledge will eventually end. Absolutes in wisdom invade our present at, a very, at very rare points because we basically deal with information. This is the information age. The future will grow brighter and brighter with truth. Knowledge will end when wisdom is established in the future in truth. Eternity will be full of wisdom. We will be eternally learning about God and his creation. Etern Eternity itself is designed by God to give us the time we need to learn everything there is to know about God and to know about his creation. We understand so little. God enjoys that we are learners. God is, ble God is blessed when we learn, when we want to learn more about him and about all he has created. Today I want to teach you a biblical pattern that I think will change your life and change the way you look at the message of Jesus. By the way, as I begin, Jesus didn't come to give us more rules or laws. Jesus didn't double down on the laws of God. Jesus didn't come to give us more rules or even better rules. 
Jesus had a better plan than rules for us humans to obey. Jesus came to take us into absolute, I mean, into abundant living, a life lived beyond the rules and regulations. Jesus didn't end the rules, but he did fulfill them. Matthew 5, 17 clearly tells us, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Something that is fulfilled has served its purpose. The law was good, and it was right. Romans seven, twelve says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. But it can't make anyone righteous. Galatians 2, 21 tells us, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. The righteousness from Jesus is the only righteousness. Philippians 3, 9 says that we are to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Let me move on. We know what life is. Life is ups and downs, challenges, victories, failures, and success. Jesus wants us to live life fully, abundantly. Jesus wants us to live with passion and with energy and with drive and abundance of life. The roller coaster of life is enjoyable when we know God designs the ride for our benefit. We can rejoice in living life well. We can enjoy the journey. The destination will be great, but the journey is as important as the goal. We are all fellow travelers in this journey together to make our world a better place through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Facing the challenges with hope and joy leads to a great life. This is a way of life that just following the rules or living life according to man-made rules can't do for us. The ten, ten Commandments do have a purpose as a teacher while we are young, but maturity leads us to live way, way beyond the rules. Did you know that man, by the time of Jesus, had made hundreds of what were called fence laws to keep people from even getting close to breaking a command of God. More rules were added on with more laws. Each of the rules had their own fence laws. Even today, just in America alone, we pass thousands of laws every year between the federal, the state, county, city. <laughs> but with all these new and better rules, we still haven't changed people's behaviors. Rules aren't made, or rules can't be made that change people's behaviors. Pa passing another law changes nothing. Enforcing the law only changes behaviors, but doesn't change the attitude or the heart. Making the life we already live and adding even more rules only makes life more complex to live. Just trying to be a good Jew or even a good Christian who follows all the rules is impossible, but this is the human way. Humans enjoy rules and enjoy telling others what to do. Jesus instead takes a different approach when he asks, is asked in Mark twelve twenty eight, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus doesn't quote one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus instead quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4 uh, through 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, stating to love God with everything you got and love others like you love yourself. The highest standard is love. The highest morals is love. The greatest commandment is love. If one loves, they will automatically obey the commandments of God. The first four commandments focus on honoring God. They focus on having one and only one God. 
This is taken care of when we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mark twelve thirty, and we shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Love literally bypasses the rules, getting directly to the heart, getting to the core of who we are. Laws hinder sin, but love advances righteousness. All too often the Jews went through the motion of religion, doing the sacrifices, doing the law, but they didn't love God. They, in a way, just tolerated God. More than likely, they believed God was keeping them from doing a lot of cool stuff. You can imagine a Jew tasting pork and wondering why God said no. Seeing their Gentiles' friends enjoying pork had to make them wonder why God was keeping them from all that fun. That is only one example of the thinking of many Jews about a multitude of things. God is not a fun killer. God is not a joy killer. God is not an enjoy, enjoyment killer. God is a lover who made us to live best when we love him and honor him in all we say and in all we do. God says no to things he knows will destroy our lives. We do know, for example, I'm not, I'm not trying to get off on a tangent that pork isn't the best meat for us physically. And all of those unclean animals that God forbid them to eat also was not the best meat for them, physically speaking, health speaking. Let me approach this idea from a different angle. I will be staying here for more, for most of the rest of this lecture to make this point very clear. There is this really cool pattern that is in Ephesians 4.28. The verse says simply, For the thief, first of all, to stop stealing. Secondly, he or she is to get a job. And thirdly, they are to give to those in need. Notice, first of all, that this is a three-part plan to change the sinner, the thief, from taking from others to becoming a productive member of society to giving to others. The law goes to a middle rule, leading to a loving standard. There's always a rule that is improved by action, but is best fulfilled by doing the loving thing. Let me be critical here for a moment and ask, how many don't steal sermons have you heard over the years? How many have we preached if you are a pastor over the years, you know what I mean. How many don't do this and don't do that sermons have you heard? Don't laugh, but isn't this kind of typical? It is as if Christianity was about not doing bad things, uh, practically not doing anything that the world defines as fun. When I was young, the hippies had long hair. Get a haircut was preached across the nation. Then the sermons focused on girls and their short dresses. The sermons were about dresses needing to be below the knees. Don't wear those mini skirts was preached across our nation. The don't sermons fill Christianity. Now it's tattoos. The sermons are don't put color on your skin. And yes, there are scripture passages that are used to make these law-type sermons biblical. Don't, don't do this and don't do that. Personally, I don't want to have long hair, so that would be an easy sermon even for me to preach. I don't want to wear a mini skirt. I might look great in one, but that isn't my thing. So I can preach that it's a great sermon also about keeping the skirts below the knees. I can feel spiritual because I don't have long hair and I don't have short skirts. Tattoos, no way, not me, nor is coloring my hair or smoking or getting drunk or even getting stoned. All of this leads me to ask, 
Why are Christians known for being against things instead of being for things? Answer, because that is what we focus on all too often. We focus on things like stealing, cussing, drugs, abortion, adultery, on and on. I think you get the idea. We are to maintain a standard, but not at the cost of our identity as Christians. We are to be known for our love. John thirteen thirty five says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Loving is the highest standard of all. What was Jesus' focus? I mean, think about it. What was Jesus about compared to the law? Oh, he did tell people to not sin anymore, but was that his focus? Jesus talked about loving God and loving others to fulfill the law. What did he mean? God gave us a basic standard of law about telling the truth, honoring parents, honoring God, don't steal, don't cover, respect one another's bodies. The law was a standard of behavior. In fact, I would make the case that this is the minimum standard of behavior. Hopefully, none of us struggle with the minimum standards, right? I mean, I think that's what we're saying. We have higher standards as Christians. In a, it's a loving standard. We are a law to ourselves. Romans 2.14 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. The rules are automatic when we're in the presence of God. The rules are automatic when we are doing the loving thing. The loving standard, the, the beyond standard, the better standard, the standard of the better, best, or excellence, those greater standards, our standard as Christians is to have the highest moral standard of excellence. We have a law beyond the rules. We have a heart that goes the extra mile beyond what is required. Matthew 5, 41, And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Let me advance here a question or two. Is the thief cured when he or she stops stealing? Society would say yes, but the Bible would say no. The Bible would just say that they are thieves that don't steal. They are still takers who have, who just have abstained from their taking. Outwardly, they are different, but inwardly, they're still the same. How about if this is the thief cured? When he or she gets a job becoming a productive member of society, again, most people would say yes, but the Bible doesn't see it that way, as the Bible is looking for a heart change. They are still just productive thieves. They may have heard the don't steal sermon by the pastor. I propose that the thief is still a thief that just doesn't steal when he stops stealing. The thief isn't cured because he stops stealing and gets a job. More to the point, we are all still sinners that don't sin when we stop sinning. Not doing something bad doesn't make a person good. Not stealing doesn't mean the person is cured. I repeat that. Not doing bad things doesn't make a person good. One has to do good things to be good. One's heart needs to change from a taker to a giver to be good. I like to talk often about not being a zero, a nothing. Not doing bad things is zero. It's boring. It's nothing. Zero sins isn't the purpose of Christianity. By the way, being sinless is the duty of mercy from God itself. Forgiveness is the work of God himself. This is better than sinning, but still shouldn't be the goal of a godly life. Being godly means doing godly things. Being righteous means doing right actions. 
That is why love is an action, not just an emotion. Love is doing the right things to the benefit of God and others. Loving God is an action. Honoring God is an action. Worship is an action. We are to be active in our righteousness and do good things. Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good is a higher standard than not doing bad things. Christianity isn't just about not doing those bad things, but should be far more about doing good things. Grace is both saying no to sin and saying yes to righteousness. One of my favorite passages of scripture, which you'll hear in these lectures probably quite regularly, is Titus 2, uh, starting at verse 11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Christianity isn't about us not doing bad things. We are for good things, and we are for living well. Okay? So when is the thief cured? The thief is cured when he or she becomes a giver. When the taker becomes a giver, he or she is cured. The world can offer a little incentive for the thief to stop stealing to avoid punishment and particularly prison but the church with prayer and spiritual ministry can do far more to cure the heart of the sinner to cure the heart of the thief the street the three-step plan for a cure given us here by the apostle paul says that with a minimum standard don't steal to an advanced standard Get a job and be productive. To an even more ultimate standard, the highest standard, give to those in need. The loving standard works every time. Seriously, it works every time. Do the loving thing. The loving thing is the cure to any and all sins. Loving God and loving others is the cure to our selfishness, pride, hate, hopelessness, lack of patience, sexual sins, jealousy, idolatry, drugs, stealing, etc. Are there other examples of this threefold loving standard in the Bible? Glad you ask. Yes, Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 tells us not to kill and adds a few verses later, don't get angry or not to hate. Then by the end of the chapter, he's lifting the loving standard of love your enemies. Let me explain that again. Jesus says that the law or minimum standard is thou shalt not kill, but then adds a new standard, a medium or a second step, a medium standard, a better standard. It is good not to kill, but it's better not to get angry or hate another person. And there is even a better standard. Love those who hate you. <laughs> wow, amazing stuff. In verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Any more? Why, yes. The adulterer is to stop that behavior. Jesus sets them a middle standard, this is in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, that we are not to lust. So the good standard is not to be sexually active outside of marriage, but the better standard is not to lust. And an even better standard of love would be to treat women like your sister or like your mother. First Timothy 5, 1 through 3, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, 
younger men as brothers, verse 2, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We are told repeatedly in Scripture to love our Christian brothers and sisters. So the standard is don't do it. Better to not even want to do it outside of marriage, and even better to love and respect those of the opposite sex. More? What about lying? The Bible says not to bear false witness. That is the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Then the Bible says to always be truthful. Uh, John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it even tells us the highest standard in Ephesians 4.15, that we are told to speak the truth in love. Love is always the highest standard. Love isn't a new or better rule. Love is beyond the rules. Love is excellence. The Old Testament focused on the minimums. The law and the Ten Commandments are the lowest of standards. Okay. Another example, Exodus 20, verse 7, You shall not take the name of your God in vain, for the Lord will hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Taking God for granted, granted, vainly mentioning him here or there, or worse, using him in profanity, are forbidden as this lowest possible standard. Honoring God is the higher standard in Samuel 2. And I don't know which Samuel that is. I don't have it here. God says, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And there's a higher standard of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength in Mark twelve 30. I've mentioned this in an earlier lecture but it's worth repeating here. Worship is loving God. It seems like every lecture somehow ties back something to worship, and here we are again. Worship is the expression of that love for God in singing or song. Worshiping God is the lifestyle of loving God in all that we say and do. Right living is righteousness. Worship is the highest standard of loving God. We were made to worship God. Worship is what we are as humans. The ultimate expression of loving God is to worship Him totally. Nothing is more fun than worshiping God. Worship is the core to understanding where the body of Christ is developing and where we are heading today, and it will be a very important part of where we land in the future because the millennium will be, and after Jesus returns, will be about connecting with God and worship will be off the charts. God will replace what we miss from these physical sinful bodies and what we think is pleasurable now will be replaced by worship. Worship is the most intimate thing that we can do. And from the core of our being, we are made spiritually to worship God. Worship is the most pleasurable thing a human being can enjoy as we come into the very presence of God and we worship Him. Jesus in the New Testament focused on the maximums. Maximums that don't need new rules because the character or core of the person is loving. The highest morals are in the person who is godly from the inside to the outside. The Old Testament was focused on the outside, trying to change the inside. It was a failure. The New Testament begins with the inside by faith and forgiveness, cleansing, washing, a fresh start that changes the heart, changes the core of the person. God knows that the only way to change a person is from the inside. 
We ask Jesus into our heart in the sinner's prayer. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. This is the New Testament approach to a changed life. The Old Testament is boring. It only tells us what not to do. While the New Testament standard of love is exciting, riveting, and full of hope, the abundant life that Jesus promised takes us to greater and greater heights of love. Love is said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, to never end. It keeps on going, making us more and more like Jesus. How moral can we can we be is only limited by how much love there is within us. Loving God, loving others, gains us greater and greater joy in our morals. Years ago, we had a royal, they had a royal wedding in England. At that wedding, the preacher challenged the world to this highest standard of love. He called it a fire that if it was lit would change the world forever. Love is a lot of fun. Love makes life abundant. Love makes life great. Jesus did encourage people to keep the law, to avoid sin, but he also encouraged people to take it even further. Forgive and forgive more. Love and love more. As I mentioned earlier, this is what Paul is trying to tell us in Romans 2.14. Let me repeat it again. When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Love is that higher standard that the law and the rules cannot match. Let me close with a math line. Remember this in school. Negative is on the left. Positive numbers are on the right and zero is in the middle. Remember that line, that math line? We begin our journey of faith by trusting in Jesus, and all of our sins are forgiving, making us, wait for it, making us a zero. In other words, we just are at zero sins. That's nothing that's bad about that. We are all clean, and we are empty, but how do we add to our lives? How do we get on this right side of the line? By doing loving acts of kindness that changes lives for the better. By doing our part to make our community a better place. We are to be positive and we are to stay positive by taking the servant's place to be great in God's kingdom. We'll focus on servanthood in another lecture in the future. Who wants to be a zero? Anyone? Zero sins is just zero. Nothing bad is just a zero. Be something good. Add to your life some good things. Trust God to be the best that you can be. Let me add a final point. Being a nothing, a zero to sin, has become the church's standard. We teach constantly against sin, whereas we should focus on righteousness. Being a zero sinner is better than being a sinner, but the best is being a good person who does works of goodness that changes lives and makes things better. In other words, good, the law, but better and best are the loving standards. Excellence is found in loving. These are great steps. Stop doing bad things. The stop stealing part. Be productive and take care of your responsibilities. The get the job part. And then work to become a giver. Now the providing for the needs of others part. Let us love. Let us set the world on fire with love. God bless you praying for you. I hope that you're gaining from these lectures and you're gaining a better understanding. Live this abundant life with gusto. Live this abundant life well. God bless you.